One summer afternoon when I was five, I was playing inside the house. There was a thunderstorm outside. And it was your typical garden variety summer thunderstorm. You know, a little bit of rain, some thunder, some lightning. No big deal, even, even for me when I was five. But I heard another sound above the dull roar of the rain on my roof. And it sounded louder. It sounded heavier. It sounded a bit like acorns falling on my roof. But I was confused because this is the middle of June and we don't get acorns falling in the middle of June. So I walked over to the window and I looked outside and this is what I saw. Little balls of ice falling. And I was still confused because again, this is the middle of June and I'm not supposed to see ice falling from the sky either. I've got no idea what's going on here. And I didn't know it at the time, but, but that moment me sitting there looking out the window watching this hail fall was the moment that marked my transformation into a weather geek. <laughs> Our relationship with the atmosphere is very complex. It, 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 weather is constantly happening, it's constantly changing, and it's impossible to avoid. You can't pack it up and throw it in the trash, and you can't move across the country and hope that it doesn't follow you. And forecasting is, is just as complex. It's often two part science and one part art. Because we've got to take all these complex variables and all these processes that are happening at the same time, and we have to compress them into basically three, three things. How warm is it going to be? How windy is it going to be? And again, is anything going to fall from the sky? It's something we've got to do and make it easy to understand. We have to communicate concepts like uncertainty and probability without using words like uncertainty and probability. And we've got to make it entertaining and informative. Now, I'm a weather geek, and I love talking about the weather. And, and we, I could do that all day long, every day, and I, I often do. But I also enjoy listening to people talk about the weather. So if I'm out in a, a public place, a restaurant, or a library, and I hear somebody having a conversation with a friend or on the phone, I'll often stop what I'm doing and just listen to what they're saying for a couple minutes. And just check in and, and perceive what they're saying about the weather and what they understand and what they share. And I find these conversations are often a bit like pieces of a game of telephone. I can tell what they mean and what they say, but there's often information that's been confused or modified or, or just dropped entirely. And so what I expect to be there isn't always there. And it tells me a lot about what people understand about what we're saying. I find that people often enjoy getting their forecast from a singular source. This is a source I've never heard of, and I don't know how this source creates its forecast or how to get forecasts that this source creates. It's a source called they. They said it's going to be sunny all week. They said it's going to rain tomorrow. They need to come shovel this six inches of partly cloudy off my driveway. <laughs> just as is forecasting, the weather is complex. And, and, and it's evolved. People, how people get forecasts has also evolved. So originally, we saw forecasts come from um, the traditional local media, the TV stations, the newspaper, the radio, the local news. The 6 o'clock news was appointment television because if you missed it, you missed your forecast and you couldn't get it back. You can't rewind and go back to it. You've got to call day and find out what the forecast actually was. In the 80s with the, the rise of cable television, uh, an upstart called the Weather Channel came along and said, hey, we're going to make a TV station. It does weather 24-7, 365, and they did. And you can turn on your TV and get that weather within the next 10 minutes. And the time it takes to have a pizza delivered, you can get your local forecast three times. <laughs> In the 90s, there was the World Wide Web. There was a, a, a simple domain name, 11 characters long, that became one of the most popular, one of the most visited, and one of the most valuable pieces of real estate on the internet. And it simply is weather.com. Now, now, take away the Weather Channel and take away the branding there for a second and just think about those 11 letters, those 11 characters, weather.com. It shares so much in such a small space. But this is 2012. 2013 will mark the 20th anniversary of the modern web browser. So the web is getting a little passe. What next? Well, I've got a smartphone. I imagine many of you do too, or a tablet, or an eye, something, or some combination of all these. And so now, with, with the, the push of a button and the tap of a screen, I, I, can, I can get weather data from, from one or several apps all at the same time. And I don't have to go to a computer. I don't have to turn on the TV. 
it's just there with me 24 7 365 but the difference is that, that all these are broadcast they all come from a single source and they go to another source and so we, we've got to find out what, what's going on behind this and, and the other thing to mention too is that meteorologists are often kind of considered to be the replacement referees of weather we don't always get a whole lot of credit when we get it right. But when we get it wrong, boy, do we hear about it. And so we've got to find a way to improve this communication with people. We've got to find a way to move beyond the broadcast from the creator to the source with no real interaction there. And so enter social media, enter platforms like Twitter and Facebook. And so now you can take that conversation. You can go from a one-way conversation to a two-way. Now, you could always pick up the phone or send an email, but it was limited to the people in that conversation, and the information often I find that needs to be shared should be shared with everyone. I can answer questions about travel forecasts. Hey, I'm, I, what's the travel forecast for Rhode to Atlanta? My mom is coming to visit me in Dublin, Ireland. What's going to happen at this event tonight? I have a friend coming in from out of town, and I want to make sure he has a good time. You can take this and you can put a name and a face and a voice, both digital and real, with the people creating your forecast. And you can get information from them as well as give information back to them. I find what I get out of a lot of these conversations is just as much, if not more, than the people that are asking me simply about forecast. But there's a lot of weather information. If you ever search the word weather on Twitter, it would be completely inundated. So we need a way to categorize this. And so we do this with something called hashtags. If you're not familiar, it's just a simple string of letters that we append to a message. It's very short, it's very concise, but it says so much about what the message is about. So if I tag my message with ALWX, I can tell people that I'm talking about the weather in Alabama. I can tag it with SWVAWX and tell them I'm talking about the weather in Southwest Virginia. Or I can combine these and talk about an event and use VA Sandy and talk about Hurricane Sandy in Virginia. During severe weather, we find people often need additional information before they'll take shelter. It's not enough to have an alert on your phone or to hear the, the tones, the, the emergency alert system tones from your TV or radio station. People need more. So they'll often run to the window or run outside to see what's going on in their neighborhood. Or they'll pick up the phone and call a friend or a family member or a trusted neighbor and get more information about what's happening in their neighborhood, in their community. And then take that information and use it to make decisions about how to best protect their own life and their property. And again, with social media, now we can share this information with everyone. And so it's not just a single person who's able to make decisions, but we can empower an entire community to make decisions about how to best protect their life and property all at the same time and without delay. We can empower communities downstream that may be impacted to take those steps and protect themselves before it's too late and before they have to step outside the window and step outside or look out the window and see what's coming and not have enough time to prepare. But there are drawbacks to this as well. People have taken advantage of this conversation and introduced false information into the stream. Sometimes this comes in the form of false storm reports, things that didn't actually happen. Oftentimes people will take pictures and either attribute them from, from instead of the, the previous event, and attribute them to the current event that's happening when that's not actually happening. Or sometimes they'll Photoshop them and manipulate them so there's something different entirely. The, the second tweet below is uh, a link that someone sent to me earlier this year of a, a tornado, a picture of a tornado that took place in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Now, the tornado is real, it happened, but the picture is not. It looked very much actually like this one. And if you didn't know the difference, you'd think that this could actually be a legitimate picture. But actually, this is a picture that I took of a tornado in May 2011 in Iowa, not Virginia. The rise of storm chasing and the rise of, of mobile data, mobile data availability, and to be able to get information on the fly and on the go. We've seen a rise in the popularity of storm chasing. Academic research groups like the one at Virginia Tech, professional storm chase tours, professional amateur photographers and videographers can now all get this data, jump on their phone, and go and hit the road as soon as they know that something's happening. The average lifespan of a tornado is less than 20 minutes. So if you don't get there in time, it's gone. 
but what we're seeing is a phenomenon called chaser convergence. We've got all these people converging on the same roads and on the same point at the same time. And now, rather than, than focusing on the, this massive super-self thunderstorm and being able to watch and appreciate it and make sure that you're not in harm's way as it progresses, you're now focused more on avoiding hitting other people in the road and avoiding being hit. And what should be your primary focus is now at best secondary or out of your mind entirely. There's always going to be risk in the unknown. Weather is certainly no stranger to this. We've got to keep sharing this information. We've got to keep empowering people and empowering communities. We need to answer the little questions. Like, who is they? And why don't meteorologists get more credit when they get it right? Just as much as the big questions. Like, why do some storms produce tornadoes when others don't? And how do we ensure storm chasers are not a danger to themselves? We've got to keep sharing this information. We've got to keep empowering people. Let's talk about the weather together. Thank you.